this time on Watchers of Tomorrow, the Enterprise engages in sex trafficking. Hello, my name is Gepwin and I am joined, as always, by my good friend, Dr. Izix. Hi! Oh, yeah, this episode, it's it's not as bad as last episode. Despite my, uh, you know, my intro there, yeah, it's not as bad as last episode. <laughs> well, it's only because less happens. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. You know, there is still awkwardness, but, you know, you know it's, it's better. <laughs> yeah, we get to join the crew of the Enterprise as they... Every, everything describes it as mail-order brides, like all the episode descriptions and all the things that I've been reading say mail-order brides. The term is never used in the episode. Nope. I, I, I guess they do uh, try to, uh, you know, defend it and, and say, no, this is not slavery, but they don't really kind of go into much detail beyond. They don't do a very good job of defending it. No. <laughs> oh, Oof. okay. So, this episode is called Muds Women. That's not a good start. Nope. <laughs> Starting off on a bad foot. <laughs> Original story by Gene Roddenberry. This mm-hmm. is one of three episode scripts that was submitted for the pilot. Um, yes. The others... Oh, I forget the third. The other uh, being... There was Where No Man Has Gone Before. Yes, was, yeah. it was the first one, which did become the second pilot. Yeah, the third one was the Omega Glory, which I believe shows up in season two. Oh, yes. Omega Glory, season two episode. So it weighs off. And then this one was submitted as one of the original pilots, but wasn't made until later. It was on the short list for the first episode. They were kind of going between this one and Man Trap for the first episode to show. So I guess maybe that's a, a question we should be asking ourselves at the uh, you know after the synopsis. Would this have made a better first episode or not? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I found some quotes, some like paraphrased quotes, I guess, from the uh, from the NBC broadcasters that could shed some light on that one. Ooh, I'm curious. I just noted this down. This was directed by Harvey uh, Hart, who I don't know as a director, but I thought it was interesting because this is the only episode of Star Trek that he ever directed mm-hmm. because... He used too many complex camera angles and went over shooting. So it was like an extra day, right? Yeah, he went over his shoot by a day, and he didn't give the editing team much to work with, apparently. So he was never invited back. So you you took too long and given everyone else trouble. So go away. Yes. This is the first appearance of guest star Roger C. Caramel as uh, Mud. We also have Karen Staley as Eve. Uh, Susan Denberg as Magda, Maggie Theory, Theory, Threat, Threat, Through, Through, Through. <laughs> yeah, one uh, of those. Thanos. She's Maggie Thanos <laughs> as Ruth. Those are the titular women. Yes. Um, I decided to list their names here because they're not actually named until like halfway through the episode. Yeah, I only you know my uh, you know original uh, run through uh, you know watching. I only caught Eve's name and just like, well, there's the other two ladies, I guess. <laughs> yeah. We've also got uh, Jean Darnowski, John Cole, and Simon Glass as three lonely miners. Yep. They are very, very lonely yeah. in a distant world. So there are a lot of guest stars this episode. Yeah. It's, I, think it's, I think this is the most outside of crew people we have ever seen the ship interact with. Yeah, so, you know, not counting, like, one-off crew people, of course. Yeah, just outside of whatever organization this is. I know it's called Starfleet later, <laughs> but I don't... I, we'll get into that as we go. I have no idea what's going on in this yeah, episode. You know, you know, ha- having some knowledge about, you know, what the organization the Enterprise may or may not belong to would actually be kind of useful for a couple sort of explanations of does this make sense or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll get into that later. (laughs) Well, let's jump in. We've been waffling on for like five minutes before we got into the intro, which I think is appropriate because the intro is five minutes of dragged on nothing. Yep. (laughs) So let's just jump in. We're we're so far on par with the episode. (laughs) I I think the the term is forced drama. Yeah, but non-dramatic forced drama. Yep. (laughs) 
Okay. On to the episode Mud's Women. Captain's Log. The Enterprise is chasing an unidentified vessel. We join the Enterprise in mid-pursuit of a small ship that Kirk is ordering that they continue to follow and starts making inquiries as to whether or not it is an Earth ship, but Spock says that there's no way to tell because they're not receiving any registration night information from the vessel. Scotty tells us that the ship is pushing its engines too hard and that they will overload if they don't stop. Ohura, who is now in a command role, apparently, because her uniform has changed color. I don't know why. I, I think it's a uh, part of the still getting settled on what the colors actually mean sort of thing. Yeah, probably but that. Continu Continuity-wise, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> she tells us that the ship is refusing communications, that uh, Spock says that they are forcing the ship into an asteroid belt, which is apparently dangerous because they turn on the shields. Then the ship that they are chasing loses power and is adrift in this field of asteroids. Apparently, this is super dangerous and the ship's going to be destroyed, unpowered, if the Enterprise does not extend its deflector shields around it. But Scotty says that that's too far away, and if they do that, they're going to be in danger of burning out their own engines and suffering the same fate as the other ship. Which is bad. Kirk, Mr. Hero, decides that that's a thing that they should do and that they should extend the deflectors, protect the other ship, and beam the crew on board. But the other ship refuses to return their signals, and... That makes them extend their shields for too long, and their lithium crystal circuits start to burn out. The ship will, like, it, it looks like some, they forgot to pay their electric bill. Like, all the lights turn out for a yeah, second. Like, oh, go brown out. And then come back on, and they go, another lithium crystal burnt out. Well, do we have extras? Um, another one burnt burn out. <laughs> yeah. The other ship finally returns their distress signal which then allows the transporter to lock onto them. Apparently that, that's how transporters work right now. You have to receive a signal, which I guess makes sense. You can't just randomly beam people off ships for no reason. Yeah, otherwise they'd be using it all the time. We're like, you know, it's like, oh, we're fighting some Klingons. Let's beam some of them into space. Yeah, and so <laughs> that took like under a minute to explain. Yes. That was the first five minutes of the episode. Yep. <laughs> and it was 90% Say a line, stare. Say a line, stare. Say a line, stare and raise an eyebrow. That was Spock. Yeah. <laughs> stare. This just th nothing was. Ha this drag. This whole. It's just drag. Dragorific. But it's supposed to be a hot pursuit. That they're going after this unknown ship. It could be anything. It could be something dangerous. It could be not a just a random transport ship. They just decided to go chase after for no good reason. It could be anything. <laughs> yeah, it could be something exciting. But yes. what it actually is, is they beam aboard one guy who's dressed like a Renfair pirate. Yep. And Arr. as someone who has dressed like a Renfair pirate, this is exactly what Renfair pirates dress like. So, so everyone watching, uh, pause the episode, go to Renaissance Fair and, check and find a pirate, and you'll know what we're talking about. Yes. You, you come back and unpause it later. Just remember, there, there are remember pictures of me that exist in this outfit. So, yeah. Tre treasure hunt <laughs> this man identifies himself as leo walsh with the mm. dumbest irish accent yes <laughs> i'm uh. leo walsh <laughs> spock asks if there's anyone else on his crew and walsh says that there are a few but he couldn't be sure the enterprise was a friendly ship but that the rest of the crew should be ready to beam aboard so get him over here rescue that crew more lithium circuits continue to burn out and this apparently makes the transporter hard to use because it starts blinking a lot. It's blinking and taking forever to transport. Yeah, I guess it's low power mode, you know. Uh, you're going to be sticking people in matter energy beams and keeping them there for minutes on end while your machines slowly work out. Uh, you know, it's like when you have too many programs open on your computer, right? Yeah, you have the, the <laughs> transporter turns off Wi-Fi. Yep. <laughs> and uh, like gets rid of all those apps that are running in the background so that it can operate on the low power and just focus on the transporting people in energy form. <laughs> yes, you know, uh, sorry, no Spotify right now. We got to beam someone over. McCoy starts to mutter about how he never trusted this thing. I'm, I'm still, I'm not sure why the doctor is in there. It's McCoy, Scotty, and some other dude and Spock just standing in the transporter. This is the most people we've ever seen operating the transporter. 
True. I, I suspect McCoy's probably there because if someone's been injured, because, uh, you know, the, uh, the transport's actually, like, getting pummeled by asteroids or something like that at this point. That's true. So the other ship is destroyed by an asteroid, and Ooh. Scotty barely manages to beam three women on board. Yes. Apparently, getting ready to beam on board meant assume model poses. <laughs> yep. Well, isn't that how you get beamed around? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to look ugly when you appear on the other ship. You gotta, gotta have, go come in with presents with a with a uh, uh, a strong entrance. Kirk asks for a report over the intercom, but everyone in the transporter room is too busy drooling. Yep, there's some jaw dropping sort of oh my sort of moments. Yeah, but not as interesting. Su I don't think Sulu's in there, so we don't get any oh my's. Kirk continues to ask for a report until Scotty finally snaps out of it enough to tell him that they beamed everyone on board. Yeah, everything's cool, Captain. We're just distracted. McCoy keeps on drooling the whole time. Spock is just amused to death. <laughs> that's probably the only redeeming feature of this whole episode is Spock is just giggling himself silly in the corner every time you see him. <laughs> like, wow, all these people around me, they're so goofy. Not keep it in their pants or something? <laughs> no, they really, really can't. Kirk orders Walsh to be brought to him immediately. Walsh and the women are walked through the hallway where we get like a panning close-up of their asses as they walk through the corridor. You're the most important detail, right? Yep, this is, this is apparently what they had to spend an extra day shooting. <laughs> Which, maybe, maybe there's more to that story why they didn't ask him back then. Mm. <laughs> Every man on the ship starts to stare at them, which seems par for the course. Yes. Yeah. In the turbo lift, Walsh identifies Spock as part Vulcanian. Vulcanian. Hmm. So is he going to erupt? Yeah, I guess. And says that the women shouldn't bother trying to seduce him because Spock can turn his emotions off at will. Yes. Uh, that's that's kind of an interesting one that he can like identify him as half Vulcan or Vulcanian just by looking. Well, you know, I guess maybe in the, you know, if you were to look into the future continuity of uh, Star Trek, you know, uh, Spock does uh, look different than other Vulcans. Yeah, he they, does a bit. Because, you know, they, they tend to have sort of a bit of like a forehead thing going on as well, not just the pointed ears. Eve, who we've not been introduced to yet, apologizes for Walsh being so rude and says that he's just used to buying and selling people. Wait a moment. Is this guy, to sl guy a slaver? Apparently no one cares. This should have yeah. been a red flag. I, ass yeah. I assume they mm. want it to mean like kind of hyperbolically, like he has a lot of money. He's used to buying and selling people's opinions and whatever. But he's he's like literally carrying around three women with him. So yeah. uh, was this before or after he he uh, describes the 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 trio as his cargo? Uh, that's the next scene. Oh, okay. So, oh, no, I spoiled it. <laughs> I know. Spoilers. Hashtag spoilers. Spock brings Walsh and the women to Kirk, who starts to demand answers, but just stops mid-sentence when he turns around and sees that there are women there. That seems pretty normal for Kirk, too. And he has shadowed mood lighting. Well, the whole yep. are, you know, when they look at the camera, it's all soft lighting. Kirk asks if this is Walsh's crew, and then he says, actually, they're me cargo. John. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So this guy must be a slaver, right? Yeah. It's the pretty much the only explanation, which no one mentions. <laughs> Entire episode, no one mentions. So, yeah. This guy seems like he is buying and selling people in the literal sense. Yep. Maybe we should, you know, do something about that. Mm hmm. Next captain's log, Kirk says that three unusual females have been brought aboard, and they have a mysterious effect on the male crew. Explanation unknown. Yes. Everything we've seen from their reaction, and the reactions we've seen in other episodes, this seems perfectly normal to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we have yet to see the crew encounter a woman that they do not randomly follow around and drool over. Correct. In fact, you know, when someone does that more than normal, they're like, oh, yeah, that's just normal. Walsh is in the captain's quarters briefing room something. Captain's space. Walsh is talking to Kirk. He says that he had no way to know that the Enterprise was a starship. 
Aside from it being in space, I guess. Yes. <laughs> was it was it a space amoeba? Was it some some uh, unknown and alien race called the Romuborg? I I don't know. And since he had three young women on board, he naturally tried to evade this strange ship that was approaching him. And he tells Kirk that he exceeded his authority when he chased them into the asteroid field and blames him for the destruction of his ship. Kirk tells him that he is convening a hearing and that Spock can give Walsh any legal information that he needs to defend himself. So so I, I think it might be kind of important at this point to sort of point out that, you know, Kirk is, pro is, is is clearly being sort of affected by the, the lure of the ladies as well. But he, he has another priority. This guy effectively screwed up the, his ship, and he's pissed. And that seems yeah. to be enough to let him to think with a clear head about all this. I guess, <laughs> sort of. They, I don't know. Clearer than normal. <laughs> I think you're giving the writers more credit than I am. <laughs> On the bridge, Sulu enters with another crewman, who's the helmsman for this episode. They do seem to go through those. Yeah, I guess it's maybe a rotating shift. So this guy, this is, a, this, if I recall, uh, noted somewhere in my notes here, that this guy uh, sort of looks like he is, like, half-starved. He's just, like, really, really skinny and, you know, all that. Yeah. So maybe, so maybe, maybe there's some sort of unfortunate uh, B-plot we never see where this guy is slowly being, uh, you know, eaten by space parasites or something. <laughs> That'd be, they, they should have just put that in here. There's no plot in this episode. <laughs> the crewman is like leaning on things and acting weak and exclaims how he can feel the women's eyes on him. So mm -hmm. tells him to shut up and get back to work, basically. Scotty tells Spock that they are in dire straits and that they only have one damaged lithium crystal left to power the entire ship and that there's no way to repair or bypass the circuit. That's bad. Because then they'll be stuck in space forever. In Walsh's quarters, the women are waiting for him to return. He tells them that they should cooperate with any kind of investigation, but not to submit to a medical examination or to volunteer too much. They all seem incredibly worried that they're going to be asked about something, but Walsh keeps saying, no, 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 they're not going to, I have it handled. But Eve isn't convinced, and she talks about how now they don't have a ship, and they're going the wrong direction for whatever it was they were doing. And yes. she calls him Harry, which really upsets him. Yes. He's like, no, you know, I'm Leo. <clears throat> hint, hint, hint. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's, oh my god, he's lying about his name. What does this mean to us? Nothing, basically. Also, is anyone surprised? <laughs> yeah. Do you know how sketchy this guy is? <laughs> oh my god, this guy who showed up in a Halloween costume might not have given his real name. <laughs> On the bridge, Kirk is informed that the ship is broke, but there's a nearby lithium mine on Rigel 12, and Kirk orders that they make their way there. Hooray, Rigel 12, Rigel 12, the 12th planet in the Rigel system. Rigel, which is a star that's, I believe, a, a blue giant of some sort, is about 800 some, uh, you know, light years from Earth. So that gives us a rough approximation of where they're presently hanging out. Ah, yeah, and they say that they're about three days away. Though, we have no idea what speed they can go with one dilithium crystal, and we've gotten no indication of how the ship even moves through space as of yet. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess there is mention of, of warp and things like that, but not really anything about what that means. And it's always sort of like warp, uh, warp one. Yeah. Sort of speeds. In the captain's log, Kirk has convened a hearing for Walsh and his passengers, but he is concerned of the hypnotic effect that the women are having on the men and the crew. So... Break them up? <laughs> yeah. But despite him being worried about the hypnotic effect that they're having on the men and the crew, the hearing is all men. Yep. We know that there are female officers on board. You know, get her in here just to make sure, you know, at least somebody's there to check them, make sure they're not doing anything ridiculous. Yeah. But they begin the hearing and they turn on the magic computer. They ask Walsh to state his name, and when he does, the computer yells, Incorrect! Lying. Spock asks for his correct name, which he first offers as Harry Mudd, which is then identified as incorrect, and finally he says that his name is Hartcourt Fenton Mudd. And he drops the stupid accent at this point. It's like, okay, I'm actually this guy. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Got there's me. a whole there's a whole liar revealed plot that went nowhere. Yep. <laughs> 
They ask about any previous offenses. He says none, but the computer corrects him and then pulls up his full record, which seems to make this entire endeavor pointless. Yep. It's like, well, you're obviously a, a criminal of some sort. Maybe we should do something about that. Well, Ruth asks if the computer can read their minds, and Mud tells her that it only knows what is on the record. But if they already have his whole record, then they can identify him by some sort of face scan thing. Why did they ask him any questions at all? Um, I guess to get him caught in a lie so they can charge him with perjury? I guess. Shrug? <laughs> the computer reports that Mud is a smuggler and counterfeiter whose ship license has been suspended for smuggling, and he was sentenced to psychiatric treatment that probably didn't work. Yeah, probably not. This is kind of a dark, like, I'll get back to this later, but, like, being sentenced to psychiatric treatment kind of hints at a pretty dark penal system in this universe. A bit, yes. Uh, it's like, well, that, that could be on the good side, just sort of counseling and maybe, like, a house arrest situation. It could also mean you're, like, in a straight jacket and tossed in a, uh, a padded room for the harsh offense of smuggling, I guess. Yeah. And being that this was written in the 60s, it only kind of stopped lobotomizing people about 10 years ago. Yeah. So. Yeah, the state of uh, mental health, uh, you know, system there is not good at that point still. It's, it's getting better, but yeah. So, Kirk reads off a set of charges, which mainly include traveling without a flight plan or ship beacon and posing a menace to navigation in addition to operating the ship without a master's license. Mud begins to explain that he was just impersonating the man who was going to be the legal captain of the ship, but, you know, he died, so he had to, like, use his name and stuff. Yeah, this is the only way to get to places, because uh, this is legal, I guess. Also, huh. space is big. I'm not a navigation hazard, honestly. Yeah, space <laughs> is too big for anything to run into anything. Except those asteroids. <laughs> yeah. While he's doing this, all the women start, like, staring at the crew and making them look really uncomfortable. Uh, Kirk asks Mud what his destination and purpose was, and he said that he was going to Officius Three to Wives Settlers. Kirk goes, what? Because that's not a word. Yes. And uh, Mud says that he finds wives for lonely settlers, and then I guess it brings them wives. Because so, uh, that's not human trafficking at all. Yeah, I, I believe the uh, the term of the old the, the old school term is uh, bringing in marriageable women. And, yep. Yeah, it's still sketchy back then. So yeah. Kirk asks the computer for any data on the women, but they have none. He requests a sensor probe. The computer finds nothing unusual about the women, but announces that all the men in the conference room are horny. Thank you, computer, for this unnecessary information. Yes. And Kirk asks that this fact be stricken from the record. Bad computer, stop revealing our secrets. Mud goes on to explain that he believes he's doing a super good deed by human smuggling people, and he's just providing companionship for poor lonely settlers. Kirk, like, finally thinks to ask whether the women are there voluntarily. They start giving, like, backstories about how they all came from, like, lonely farm worlds and things. Yes, and yes. Eve says that they all came from planets without marriageable men. Yeah. The tragedy. Oh no. She came from an automated farming world where she had nothing but farming machines and two brothers that she had to cook for and clean for. And she is just all upset that, that they're taking them away from the place where there are men who are willing to be their husbands. So... No courtship, no love, no... No, nothing. Just And not only that, they're just so angry. Like We have men who are willing to be our husbands. And you're taking us away from these men who are willing to be our husbands. It's so horrible and cruel. Could you maybe conceive of a life where you're not married? Like, doing it for yourself, maybe? Apparently not. Where you don't have to cook and clean for somebody? Where you don't have to put up with their crap because they're ungrateful or, you know... Oh, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kirk closes out the hearing and says that they're going to hand Mud over to the authorities as soon as possible. And Sulu reports that the last crystal just burnt out and now life support is on emergency backup power. Oh dear. Kirk orders that they contact the mining colony immediately and have the crystals ready as soon as they get there. Mud's super excited that 
to hear that they're going to a world full of rich, overworked, lonely miners. And he might get husbands for these girls after all. And then he's soon going to be running this ship, which he yells in front of two guards who are standing not three feet away. They apparently are deaf or something. Yep. Or, or maybe maybe like guards in, in the you know this era of Star Trek have some sort of like special code where they're not supposed to ever say what they overhear. Yeah, you you stand in the room, <laughs> but you're in strict strict confidentiality as to anything the prisoners actually say. Yeah, so you're like their lawyer, but not. <laughs> Ugh. Captain's log again. We get so many superfluous captain's logs this episode. Yes, <laughs> the ship is still screwed. And Mud's women are still confusing people and making them horny. Yep. They're intoxicating. I think they just thought people were going to be tuning in and out of this episode, so they have to recap us on the plot every five <laughs> minutes or so. In Sick Bay, Ruth asks if she can come talk to McCoy, who starts drooling again. Yes, uh, I-, I noted this down as one of the ladies preys on McCoy with soft lighting. Yep. Basically that. McCoy is like all smitten. She starts flirting with him, and then she walks by a machine that goes beep beep. beep, 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 beep McCoy beep, is surprised beep, 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 that this happens, and then she asks her to walk by it again and again. It goes beep beep, and McCoy like stares at her. It shouldn't do that, but he's too distracted by Ruth, and she just starts asking him for information about the miners on this planet that they're going to. I'm more interested in this miner business. Uh... You know, I'm going to ignore this whole, my, you know, your scanner's going off. But just tell me about these guys we might be meeting here. Or you know what? He then asks if she's wearing an unusual perfume or something radioactive. <laughs> like you do. Yeah, just like you do. <laughs> also, perfume can mess with his medical equipment. I guess? <laughs> uh, I, mean, I am glad. I was thinking during this scene, I'm glad that he acts confused. Because so often you have things where a machine starts acting weird, and you're supposed to know it's acting weird, but you've never seen this machine before in your life, so, you know, for all I know, it's supposed to beep every time someone stands in front of it. Yeah. But no, he says it shouldn't do that. It's like, no, this is a radiation detector. Something weird is going on. (laughs) Sort of the implication. Back in Kirk's quarters now, Eve is lying on the bed. Because people just wander into Kirk's room all the time. <laughs> Apparently. This is like the third time. So, yeah. They don't lock. The, nobody has locks on this ship. She says she had to come into the room to escape all of the crew that were staring at her. Kirk says they usually don't do that, which is just, that's bull, Kirk. <laughs> Kirk, you should know your crew better. We have seen six episodes of your crew doing exactly this. I don't know. Someone's acting weird again and, and staring at people in a funny fashion. Again? Yeah, again. Though this is the first time. But <laughs> Again, for the first time. Eve says that they're probably all lonely and that Kirk is probably the most lonely because he doesn't get to sleep with any of the women on board being captain and all. She's about to start making out with him, but then she like pulls back and goes, No, I like you too much to, to go through with this and I hate mud for making me do that. And she like runs away. We follow Magda into Mud's quarters. She and Ruth are reporting on the information that they've gathered about the miners, Mm -hmm. which is that there are exactly three of them, which is enough to go around. They're in good health. They're about the right age. So everything's just lining up for Mud's human trafficking operation here. Yeah, everything's going peachy keen, and we should be happy? I guess. Mud exclaims that lithium is worth thousands of times its weight in gold. And so these miners are like super rich people who could like buy them a planet and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to, you know, sort of point out that in the, uh, you know, uh, DS9 era, they do sort of talk about, you know, you know there's, there's lots of gold pressed latinum uh, going on. But, uh, you know, the gold component of that is actually the worthless part in the future. Yeah. Well, <laughs> season one of of next generation they flat out say gold is worthless yep <laughs> like, oh yeah gold whatever <laughs> apparently that's changed at some point yes yeah eve enters and mud kind of chides her for noticing the captain i guess she likes him too much or something uh, but yeah. then she starts to feel weak and says it must nearly be time 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 what time is it is it what 
there's something going on. Are they really radioactive and, they're, and they need their uh, anti-radiation uh, medication so they don't, like, expire? Maybe. On the bridge, Kirk has to yell at the helmsman for not inputting the course that he wanted. The helmsman, like, hits a button and enters the course. How many times did the helmsman, like, not hit the one button that they need to do for their job here? Uh, plenty. Uh. <laughs> Scotty says they have enough power to reach Rigel 12, but only just. So, ticking clock, apparently. Yes. Kirk asks McCoy if he did his frickin' job and examined the women, but McCoy says that they didn't want to be. So you didn't do your job. Got it, McCoy. Uh, next time we're in the space dock, let's get a new doctor. They sh- they had the new doctor for one episode. <laughs> that guy seemed to know what he was doing. Yep. Sorry, McCoy, but you're the bad replacement. Then they just both talk about how beautiful the women are, but maybe they're not beautiful. Spog is just staring at them, laughing to himself. Yep. <laughs> McCoy suggests that maybe they aren't pound for pound as beautiful as other women. That's not. There's no. No one talks like that. No, it's 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 just a weird line. It, you know, yeah. Talking about acting beautiful and. Yep. Are they acting beautiful? No. For, strike that. Forget. He even thinks it's stupid because he says strike that as soon as he says it. Kirk asks if something more sinister is happening, and McCoy kind of jumps to alien illusions. <laughs> well, you know. Uh... You know, just every once in a while we run into aliens that pretend they're somebody else and they go on a uh, assault binge and, you know. And we have seen that before, so I guess it's not too much of a stretch. He says that any alien intelligence that would be able to keep this going would keep his medical scanner from going beep. Yeah. And Kirk's just like, what? And McCoy says, I don't know. And then we cut away. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that doesn't seem like an alien invasion, but we're just not sure what's going on. When my hmm. medical scanner went beep. <laughs> so it could be, but that implies the aliens are dumb. Uh, hmm. maybe, uh, maybe, could aliens oh well. actually be you know, low intelligence and just sort of fumbling oh. through and we're just not noticing? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Back in Mud's quarters, Magda's gotten her hands on a communicator and the frequency for contacting the mining colony. And Mud calls them up. And we don't hear all of the conversation, but he is now in contact with the mining colony. Yeah, I, uh, what's the frequency, Bagda? Sorry, I had to do a what's the frequency, Kenneth, uh, reference there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did kind of like it. They say top space frequency, which I didn't catch, but it's kind of an interesting one that they're making a distinction between top space frequencies and subspace frequencies. Oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't catch that. That's actually quite clever. So I guess they're close enough to not have to use subspace and they can just use regular super radio or whatever it is they've got. Which I guess might explain why Yahura doesn't, like, pick it up on her your console there. That's true. Sulu reports that they are losing power, but they have enough to make temporary orbit. Spock tells them that they have about three days before they crash, and Kirk orders that they beam the miners aboard as soon as possible. Get those boys up here so we can ask them to give us the di- uh, the, not, not dilithium, lithium crystals. Yep, so not that, dilithium so yet. So that we can, like, not die. Back in Bud's quarters, Ruth is not looking good. Neither is Magda or Eve. Oh no, something terrible must have happened to them. Ah. Ruth and Magda keep demanding Mud give them pills, and he's frantically going through drawers. But Eve's all depressed off in the corner and says that they are nothing but a cheat cheat mud says that she's just interested in kirk so that's why she's sad but kirk's already married to his ship so meh he finally finds a small case ruth and magda grab whatever's in the case immediately but eve kind of hesitates and is like no i don't want to take it but mud tells her that it's you know not a cheat it's just a miracle so that's convincing i guess (laughs) She grabs it. It's this weird, like, red, glowy pill that she just holds a lot. Yeah, you know, I, you know, my my, my uh, notes will say, you know, she the pill sparkles and she grips it in her hand and then cuts to black. Yep. We then like show the other two, who after taking it now have better hair and makeup. So they've changed makeup uh, from the my skin is splotchy and has like burn marks sort of thing going on to, you know, soft lighting vision. In the conference room, Kirk and Spock ruminate over a burnt crystal, and Kirk says that he still made the right decision to blow out the ship's power because it saved Mud and his passengers. Despite them chasing them into the asteroid field in the first place, but you know. 
Yeah. The miners who they beamed aboard enter and say that they have lithium, but they're not interested in selling it. They would prefer to trade it for Mud's women and that they have agreed to release Mud and drop all charges. I don't know how they have the authority to do that. Yeah. I guess it's because it's their planet, Shrug. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I guess to a certain degree, the fact that there are charges does imply that there is a larger you know, interplanetary government and that the fact that these miners even care about this at all implies that they are a part of that interplanetary government and thus they should be uh, obligated to operate under the rules of that interplanetary government. And clearly by making this demand, they're not doing so. Yeah. This whole thing gets confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll talk about it a little after, but yeah, what what the what is the enterprise? <laughs> what 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 even is it? <laughs> yeah, what what even is this th this thing we're watching? <laughs> they tell Kirk that he doesn't have any choice because they've hidden the crystals. You're not going to find the crystals. It's not like it's a planet filled with them or something. So we can't go into the mine and just mine them ourselves then. Okay. Yep. Kirk still refuses, saying that they will need medical services or transport or something eventually. So they should think about not ticking off the starship captain. Yep. <laughs> Mud enters with the women. And the miners just seem immediately like interested in them. Like, hello, uh, Kirk continues to refuse, and Mud points out that with only three days left in orbit, that he will have to capitulate sooner or later. Groovy. <laughs> Kirk, Spock, and Mud bleem. <laughs> bleem. Don't worry, we all, we all leave sometimes. Kirk, Spock, and Mud beam down to the planet to see the miners. And apparently, all the women are already there. They're having some sort of party. Yes, they're hanging out, and everyone's having a good time, and there's like some dancing sort of thing going on. Kirk tells the head miner, Childress, that they have won, so they should hand over the crystals already. But Childress dismisses him and says that he is busy. And he goes over to talk to Eve. When they have the time, he said, Well, there's this ship with hundreds of people up there that could crash into this planet and kill them all. And you say you don't have the time right now. Uh, real... Childress is just enjoying his little power trip there. Yeah, yeah, real nice guy, this. Yeah. So he starts talking to Eve about how horrible this planet is. She's not. He says wrong. it's windy all the time. There's dust storms. If you walk a few feet from your own door, you could get lost and die. Eve starts coughing and says that it must be the dust. Mm -hmm. And Childress gets just so upset that she doesn't like this horrible planet that he, she is on. And then goes off and tries to dance with some of the other women. I'm cutting This in. starts a fight between two of the other miners. And Eve runs out saying, what if you hold a raffle and whoever loses gets me? Guess she's just upset at the lack of interest in her. Yeah. And she runs outside. Kirk chases after her with the miners yelling, no, if you go out there, you'll get killed. We then see Eve stumbling around in the dust storm, and Kirk is stumbling around after her, but I guess loses sight of her and just starts yelling. We then also see Childress also run out after her. Mm -hmm. Back on the bridge, Kirk says they've returned to the Enterprise to search for her with the ship's sensors, but that the sandstorm is making it too difficult to scan. Scotty says they're drawing more power and wishes that they'd gotten the crystals, and Kirk goes, fine, I didn't get the crystals, okay? What did you want? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, man, but, you know, those miner guys are so mean. Ah. O'Hara is contacted by the miners who say that the storms are worse than ever, and neither Eve nor Childress has been found. And Kirk just apologizes for yelling at Scotty, who tells him that they only have five hours of power left. So he's, he's, Scotty's a little, obviously a little nervous. <laughs> back on the planet, Childress has found Eve, and he takes her back to his weird cave house. It's like the Flintstones. Yeah. We get the captain's log, which informs us that time has passed because now there's only 45 minutes of power left. Yeah, well, uh, my, my notes here is spend all their power, ship doom, storm's easing up. Sabak finds a heat signal that may be a cooking stove. Hooray. Kirk says that he's going to beam down with mud. Let's go check out this possible cooking stove. Yeah. What's that about? Maybe there's food. Yes. <laughs> we can get bacon? Sweet. <laughs> Back on the planet, Eve is cooking. 
Childress wakes up and complains that she moved stuff and then complains that she's cooking. And then he just says, I never laid a hand on you, which is something normal, innocent people say all the time. Yeah. You know, everyone I meet are just go, I never laid a hand on you. I did not hit her. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> uh, I walked into that one. <laughs> <laughs> he continues to complain that she made food and then tastes it and says that he's made better food. And she says that his pans are dirty. And he goes, Dilla, there's no water. She goes, well, you can put them out in the wind and let the storm clean it, stupid. And then he does that. Wait, they don't, they don't have any water on this planet? Yeah, there's no water, apparently. They're all gonna die. He comes back from hanging the pans outside to be cleaned, apparently. Yep. <laughs> and when he comes back in, she's playing cards. Next. But now looks more normal. Less soft, lighty, and made up. Yeah. They, they're trying to make it out to be ugly, but she's just not wearing as much makeup. Yeah. So you, you, you've reverted to normal-ish. Ah. Oh no! What? <laughs> he asks if she's playing solitaire, and she says that no, it's a different game called Double Jack. Mm -hmm. He tells her what to do if it was solitaire, and she says, "But it's not solitaire, so I don't do that." And then he gets upset and throws the game off the table and yells that she's homely. Wait, wait a moment. I think I know this guy from Twitter. Yep. Yep. He then yells that he agreed to pay lithium crystals for queens and continues to throw stuff. So like he's, he, he like flat out says, I bought you because I thought you were pretty. Yeah. Uh, Real winner you found here, lady. Kirk and Mud enter. Childress again yells, I didn't touch her. Super great guy. Mm-hmm. Kirk tells Mud to come clean about what's going on, and they tell everyone about the Venus drug. Venus drugs. Yeah. This is what Mud calls a harmless drug that gives you more of whatever you have and makes men more muscular and aggressive and women more beautiful and feminine. Ooh. So um, that's apparently all that people have? Yep. It's a magic drug that makes you pretty, you know, apparently. You know, women all become more demure and uh, sparkly, while men become huge and muscly and, uh, and stuff. And that's all everyone it breaks down to, again. Yep. Childress is upset that all the women look the way Eve does. Oh my god. And he finds out that the other men are already married. Oh my god, it's horrible. Oh no. <laughs> He starts yelling about how he fought and almost died and should have died, but now they finally have the good life in their hands, and now they got ugly wives. Which also, this is the good life? You live in a cave with no water. Yes, on a planet with just a couple other people where you mine all day. Eve says that he doesn't want a wife. He wants the pills, but that's not real. And then she takes a handful of pills and, like... After a few useless back and forth shots showing everyone just staring at everyone, mm -hmm. she turns around and her hair and makeup are done again. Surprise! Eve then has this monologue about how this is the wife that he wanted. He didn't want someone to help him cook and sew and clean and cry for him. He wanted a vain, selfish, pretty wife. And that's wrong. Kirk says, hey, it's quite a woman. Hey, hey, Childress. Hey, hey, hey. Know what I mean? Hey. Hey, hey, yeah. Yeah, you, you agree? Yeah, yeah, this is good. This is what you want. All right, right? Cool. Ah. And Childress says, no, it's just fake. It's just that pill. And Kirk goes, no. Because that wasn't the drug. It was a placebo that we gave her. Oh, wow. We changed them out for gelatin pills. Yeah. Yeah. So, it just what? <laughs> made her confident enough to put on hair and makeup. <laughs> Suddenly, when they were watching, right there. Yep. Childress <laughs> then hands over the crystals and says that Eve will stay. Eve? You don't want to stay there. <laughs> Kirk asks if Eve wants to stay after a while, and she says that Kirk is already married to the Enterprise. Eve, you don't... You don't have to leave with Kirk to be with Kirk. You could leave with Kirk. Yeah, you could just leave. And just leave. 
Mud asks if he can be left behind on the planet. And Kirk says, no, but I'll appear as a character witness at your trial. And Mud does not find this reassuring. <laughs> McCoy says Kirk did a good job down there, and he should consider getting into the medical business. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, <laughs> that he gave her a sugar pill. I don't know. So wait, 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 wait. This gets, goes back to McCoy not actually being a very good doctor. Maybe McCoy just only get, get, ever gives everyone sugar pills and it just kind of works sometimes. <laughs> Spock says he's glad that the entire annoying emotional episode is over. And so am I. Yeah. Ah. Uh, McCoy is a racist again for a minute and the Enterprise flies off like everything's fine. Yeah, it's like, well, that's a thing that happened. Yep. Space! Uh, <laughs> uh, uh. A head full. Let's get out of here before anyone thinks about this too hard. Yep. I'm getting a little tired of having nothing to talk about on this show but sexism. Yeah. It's a little, a little tiring and just it feels a bit samey. Well, uh, how, how about I, uh, you know, interject with, uh, uh, you know, you know, my my awards early on here. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, um, give us a rest. So I, I guess the first thing is, uh, of course, the obvious slavers' paradise. You know, an idyllic future where you can make money delivering a cargo of people to random people across space. The economics of this don't really make any sense unless either slavery is legal. Which they're trying to say is not, but it kind of implies it is. Or there is some sort of weird language shift that we just don't really understand. The but we, you know, we've already talked about some more details of that already. But um, yet my other award is even in the future, nothing works. So you you can't identify a freighter that you're chasing. You can see the freighter. You can you have it on your screen. You can you can like zoom in maybe because the future you should be able to do that. But you can't. Uh, the transporters are having issues. You know. You know. With you know. Sure, there's power outages and things like that, which could be disrupting the uh, the systems. But you'd think that in mid beam, you'd be like giving that a priority and all that fun stuff. There'd be like capacitors and you know transformers and you know some sort of battery backups to make sure that you're not losing people in the middle of the beam out due to power failure. Um, and also, you know, quickly burning out a key component of the ship. Yeah, well, without any backups for not any really sort of super good reason other than we're just struggling to go faster. Yeah, they they never have backups of these things. Yeah. <laughs> In any series, they've never had backup crystals. Are they, like, dangerous just to have on a shelf somewhere? I'm, I'm really not sure why. <laughs> they never say. Yes, hmm. I, I guess maybe uh, I don't really have didn't note down an award for it, but uh, you know, you know, new and interesting world because uh, this planet isn't cold. It's not, you know, not just sort of generic. There's a weird sky thing going on, but it actually has wind and weather, and you actually have to worry about that. And it's like, yeah, if you go out there, you're gonna die. But then you don't. Yeah, so <laughs> that was like I, I wanted to like some of this episode because of that kind of thing. Yeah. It is kind of the most off the ship interaction we've gotten. We've got somebody from another ship. Mm -hmm. So like there's at least two ships now. Yes. Maybe like three, but one of them they'll now both ships they've met have blown up. So yes. <laughs> Enterprise is still the only ship. Well, oh, maybe maybe I should make a make a Highlander award. There can be only one <laughs> ship. <laughs> They, they tried to do some like universe expanding stuff because mm -hmm. apparently the Enterprise are space cops. Yeah. They pulled the guy over for driving without a license. Yeah. And that's but something you need. everything's just so confusing. <laughs> so it, it, Wait, it's uh, pieces of world building, but none of it really sort of fits together well. Yeah. Apparently Starship is an official designation of police ship, not just a, a ship. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's yeah. like the you know big police star on the front or something, except it's a Yeah. <laughs> and they, they have the authority to detain and then hand this dude over to authorities. They also have the authority to like, like threaten minors with not getting medical supplies and stuff. Yep. But the minors, I guess, are not beholden to whatever organization is running the enterprise. So you can't just like, I don't know, 
beam these guys up. It's like, you're under arrest. Go hang out in the brig. Also, we're about to crash in a couple hours here, so you might want to let us know where these lithium crystals are. Kind of a dick move, but if you're going to be arresting them anyway, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I guess there might not be any... There, there doesn't seem to be any kind of centralized government dictating what all these human worlds are doing. Yeah. Uh, because apparently there's human trafficking and everyone's cool with it. Eh? Yep, everyone's cool with the human trafficking. There's apparently money. Yeah. It's, this is the first time we've heard of money. Everyone keeps naming precious gems and minerals. Yes. And there's these lithium crystals, which get retconned into dilithium. I'm not going to rag on that too much. Just any anytime they say lithium, it gets changed to dilithium later. Yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can sort of see it as slang, but someone like in universe off screen brings up you know we should just actually call it what it is so people don't get confused they're like oh okay. yeah because <laughs> if they were mining lithium on that planet they should be way more chill yeah <laughs> it's like well yeah it's, it's lithium it's kind of everywhere yeah but also like lithium is a mood stabilizer yeah <laughs> so they shouldn't be that upset yeah these miners are kind of jerk faces yeah they're uh yeah hmm. so that's that's the so there's the human trafficking. They, they ask them if they want to be there, so it's totally okay, you know? Because anyone who's being shipped across the galaxy to marry someone is going to say, yeah, I totally volunteered for this. It's fine. Yeah. Don't I'm, worry I'm, about it. I'm not under threat of being sent back to the place I was at that was horrible or I would like to escape from forever. Or I'm not addicted to some sort of weird miracle magic drug thing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not space heroin at all. Yeah. And just, just there's there's no plot here. There's uh, there's no plot. It's just filled with plot holes. Nothing happens for an hour, and they still drag it out too long. Yep. I, I guess I'm gonna sound a little scattered this episode, just because there's there's nothing here. Yeah, it's... Like we can talk about the stupid domesticity sexism, which I, like we'll get to, but mm -hmm. like as, apart from that, nothing happens, and then. The whole thing at the end of it's fine. She just had to believe in herself to be sex trafficked. Believe in the heart of the uh, not drugs or something. What? <laughs> it made her confident. It made her confident enough to be able to stay with the abusive asshole on the mining planet. Which maybe it's tr trying to suggest that. He's only an abusive asshole when she's not confident. But that doesn't make sense and is not a good message either. No, it's not a good message. Yeah, he only gets angry once she gets ugly, except she, he, the guy's just a, an ass. Yeah. So, he rescues her and then goes like, oh, I, I hate you. So well, then why'd you rescue her? Just because you felt bad about someone dying, but not a whole ship? I'm... And he gets mad at her. He gets mad at her on the on the thing before because she doesn't want to dance with him because she's coughing like well so you're going to force this lady who's definitely in distress right now to do something she's not necessarily keen on because of that distress yeah and then she's just he's just angry about it that she doesn't want to dance angry and selfish but then she's upset that people aren't interested in her as like a sex slave object uh, and then there's that whole domesticity spiel. Mm -hmm. uh, the the whole thing, the last ten minutes of this episode turns into the honeymooners. Yeah, like like she's doing cooking and they're just angry, yelling at each other. But it seems like they're trying to play it off as some kind of comedy. Since it's in a cave, I just kept thinking Flintstones yeah. <laughs> the entire time. Like, well, you know, uh, Fred, um, maybe if you like, I don't know, weren't a caveman. And these are supposed to be, like, the super wealthy miners that is like, yay, now you get to go marry rich husbands who live in caves with no water. So so, so maybe the, the, the implication is that these guys are going to be on there on that planet for a short period of time, then they're going to go somewhere nice to rich, you know, live off their riches for the rest of their days. And so this is a temporary situation, but that doesn't really kind of come out in the episode. It's sort of like, yeah, so we're just sort of here forever, apparently. And even with that, they just have that stupid thing of you should be happy if you can get a rich husband. No, no, yeah, this is there, there's more to love and relationships than being with someone who has resources. You know, it, you know, if you are only looking for that, then that's maybe a problem with you. 
because you're going to never be happy with just you know spending money because as i say money can't buy happiness folks you're, you know when you you can be stuck with someone who's you know hateful who abuses you who maybe not doesn't physically uh you know strike you but does everything up until that point and just sort of makes your life miserable for years on end that's just constant suffering so what if he's rich this whole thing just it reeks of an idea that was out of date in the 60s that just this this all comes this whole like marriageable bachelor the pride and prejudice thing they've got going on here is just from from that period of history when women were completely considered property of their fathers until they were married off and then they were property of their husbands so women were if since a woman wasn't allowed to work or do any of the things that would allow her to be independent not being married was like the worst thing that could happen to you so you know of course you're going to get shipped off to your like husband you've never met before which wasn't particularly uncommon at the time and then you know that's all you care about because you know i'm getting shipped off to be married and all i can do is be married and take care of my husband but there there are officers on this ship they're acting like they have no agency here they're acting like they should just be super happy and stoked about being married like in in the fiction of this episode they are super happy and stoked that they're just off to be married but they are conveniently forgetting that there are women like working and living aboard this this ship as they speak Yep. who don't have to have like the goal of being married to some random dude indeed and, and in fact uh it's sort of implied that her is probably unmarried uh, as well as the other ladies so they yeah so they don't need husbands in this future except in this particular case with these particular women for some reason apparently working on one of these ships is the only good life a woman can get all right everybody let's join starfleet so we can avoid this madness Mm. And then there's the whole speech that Eve gives at the end about how he should want a wife who wants to help him cook and sew and cry. I can, and to a certain degree, I could understand wanting to be, you know, in a relationship where you're not just one thing, but to be three other things and that's it as well is also not a good thing. Well, just the way she's she's talking about it as the only thing that i should be good for in a relationship yeah like this is what i should be doing in a relationship is taking care of husband yeah like mm. you want me to be pretty but i want you to want me to cater to your every need so either way it's basically serving the guy yes and she it's has just no, she gets uh, nothing out of it roddenberry should stop writing scripts <laughs> Every time he's touched one of these things, we get this crap. Now, uh, uh, if I recall, the the teleplay was uh, uh, not by Ron and Mary, but he did do the the, st uh, the story. So. Yeah, he did the original story, and from everything that I've read, once he touched a story, like that was mostly it. He would go back and do rewrites and just just mess with it until it was what he wanted. You know, it's like some sort of, you know, like, uh, you know radioactive, uh, you know, exposure thing going on. Roddenberryum. <laughs> Maybe that's what her perfume was. Roddenberry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, hey. it's, 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 it's kind of shocking that this was better than the previous episode. The only reason that this is better than the previous episode is because there was not a sexual assault on camera yeah that's it and and sort of you know thinking you know it's like okay so what are what's going to happen with these ladies now after the enterprise flies off we never have to think about splitting again what's going to happen to them is probably not going to be a very good life at all yeah but it's fine because not only are they married but they showed them that all they needed was confidence to be the pretty sexy wives that the miners wanted. And that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no. What even was that plot with the pills? It shows up out of nowhere for no reason. It goes nowhere for no reason. When did Kirk even find out about this? <laughs> he didn't, really. 
Apparently there was a cut monologue mm -hmm. where I guess they find out about the pills and Mud has like a long monologue trying to convince Ahura to take one. I remember seeing notes on that and, you know, but cut for time because, you know, yeah. we have so but, much going yes, on this episode. <laughs> I know. How did you cut for time? You didn't even have enough b-roll to fill the episode because you had to keep using the same reaction shot of eve five times <laughs> all right look at the camera smile nod slightly okay you're good now do it five more times <laughs> they didn't even do it five more times it's the same shot <laughs> oh i i should have been paying more more attention to, you know you know she did the uh the reaction shot and like had the uh, background of the enterprise or not i should have been looking for that <laughs> well see they never give them an actual background like it's it's a kind of a fun quirk of the show oh, yeah. and they probably do it exactly for that kind of editing reason but they never actually have anything in the background anytime there's a close up reaction shot of one of the characters they're in front of a neutral colored background mm -hmm. there's oh. no stuff behind them it's not like a recognizable wall or ship interior or exterior or anything it's just a random color behind them yeah. I, i'm like i don't know i'm i'm running out of things to say on this episode, I try to have discussions with some people beforehand just so I can wrap my head around what's going on in the episode. And even everyone that I talked to about this was like, nothing happened. I can't, like, you, you can't even look at this and say this is what they were trying for. Like, last episode, they had, like, they handled the situation horribly, but you could kind of see the point they were trying to make. You could kind of look at where they were aiming for. This one, they don't even seem to be aiming for anything. I guess the nearest I could figure is that they're trying to sort of establish that there are, you know, uh, you know, you know, not alien super beings out there that can be a menace to the Enterprise, I guess. <laughs> the only thing that's a menace to the Enterprise is that they're horny. Yep. <laughs> the crew is the menace to the Enterprise. <laughs> and some of the weird stuff is like this episode was actually not directed badly i mm -hmm. wanted to like some of it because they were they had some more interesting camera work which we talked about yeah. and it was used for stupid sexist male gaze things but eh. and they they set up a few things like it in one scene like magda is in the background flirting with a guy who like shows her a communicator mm -hmm. and then later she shows up with a communicator so it's like okay they even had like, like set up in the background of another scene that's kind of cool yeah it's sort of the subtle uh, like hint hint there's more going on here than you realize stuff yeah but i love it but then know, you know, in, in, the in whole shows. thing just goes out the window i don't know eve's they, they they keep playing up that there's supposed to be some sort of thing where eve is like really into captain kirk and she's just upset that he's not interested. That this doesn't kind of go anywhere. <laughs> well, they they mention it a few times, but they never show it. They they're only really together for like one and a half scenes. Mm -hmm. Like I I love you, but even though I just met you two minutes ago, ah. <laughs> yeah, and then later at the end, he does everything in his power to pimp her out to this minor dude. It's like, well, I guess I got a subtle. I guess. Mm -hmm. Just, just ins and then so he's not okay with trading the women for the crystals. Yeah. Early on, he goes, "No, we're not going to do that." For for no reason that they explain. It kind of seems like he just doesn't like being pushed around because he really does not seem to have a problem with the miners like trading the crystals for people. Yeah, just not in this case, sort of. <laughs> yeah like at the end he's like everything's fine because i just proved that they're actually beautiful on the inside <laughs> happy ending so so i've forgiven my anger uh, forgotten my anger so we can move on and not die and that's how things turn out i guess yeah i guess and also they, they spend six hours looking for childress and eve mm-hmm then right at the end, when they have about half an hour left of power, by my count, he's like, oh, do I have to send in search parties or are you going to give me the crystals? Like, if that was an option, <laughs> why did you not send in the search parties three days ago? Yep. When you got there. It's like, well, these binder people are obviously being unreasonable and are cool with all us all dying, so maybe we should just not care what they say. They're also, like, trying to buy slaves 
yep. from this weird space pirate looking dude on your ship. So they're obviously up to no good. Yeah, these are not nice people. Yeah, yeah we, we should just sort of ignore them, their, their protests, and do what we need to survive. Because eventually we're going to be, you know, sending in the, you know, the more competent space cops to go deal with these people. Yeah, and I just want to make sure that I touch on this adequately. Because I realize that I've been a little scattered. This episode's kind of hard to talk about with how little is going on. It's a scattered episode, so it's okay to be scattered. But I just want to make sure that I hit this point well. This is a textbook abusive relationship. Yep. The the things that they show in Childress's and Eve's interactions is textbook domestic abuse. Yes. He gets angry at her for not looking good enough for him and starts throwing things around. But every time he gets angry or throws something or kicks something or does something threatening, he goes, I never touched you, and that makes it okay because I never touched you. Which is faulty logic. Well, it's faulty logic, but it's also an abuse tactic that people use. Abusers always have this one line they won't cross, and they will tell you about it over and over and act like they're such a great amazing saintly person for not crossing whatever line they've decided is like if i go this far it's fine yeah the you know it could be worse you know hint 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 they'll they'll do everything up to and then they'll act like a saint for not hitting you so should we bow should we you know sing your praises for only you know you know you know throwing us to the ground and tearing through our emotional uh, you know you know barriers at every opportunity to you know damage our things or basically try to destroy our you know other relationships with other people uh, any other sort of other you know, uh, numerous terrors we should be happy for all of those because it could be worse <sighs> so I'm, I'm going to cop to i haven't i haven't gotten a chance to read the entire thing but there's a really good book called why does he do that inside the minds of angry and controlling men if you look if if we have places to include links i'm going to try really hard to remember to put one in if i can i'm not sure how our format's going to work for that quite yet at this point. But yeah. uh, this book is available for free. You can get a PDF download. Um, or it's also like fairly cheap on like Amazon and Google Play. And it's just a really good full description of like all the things to look for with abusive people, kind of how they think, what can be done about it, mostly on anyone who's near them side is to, you know, get away as safely as possible. Mm-hmm. But there's all kinds of stuff, and even like how difficult they are to treat. Yes. Because they like they like someone who's abusive doesn't seek psychological help because they think everything's fine. So they're incredibly difficult to treat and change, and you know, get them to any kind of better place. So once someone is demonstrated they are abusive, there's they don't change that. Yeah, yeah there needs to be you know at, you know. Though it's unlikely, you know, some sort of massive life change that, you know, results in some sort of, quote, wake-up call. But even that's, like, unheard of. So just just to reiterate, because I've realized I said it kind of out of order. It's, uh, why does he do that? Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men by uh, Laundry Bancroft is the full thing. So, you know, look that up. It is available as downloads, and it's fairly cheap to get elsewhere, too, so... You know, it's it's a pretty good resource for that kind of thing. I have only read sections of it, and I've had someone who did read it tell me some things about it, but it's a very good resource. Yeah, let's check it out. But just, this is a textbook abusive relationship, and everyone acts like it's great and fine because she can be pretty enough for him. So I think uh, I'd like to sort of say what I would have done if I was Kirk at the end of the episode, assuming that I was derpy all the way up until that point. So, okay, we got our our crystals. All right, beam up the girls. We're out of here. Yeah. (laughs) I would have just, like, they, they apparently have the authority to arrest people. Yep. So arrest people. (laughs) <laughs> these miners like threatened the lives of everyone on your ship i don't know what kind of laws they have in the future but generally this sort of like i have the ability to save hundreds of people and am refusing to directly for traceable reasons 
is considered some sort of illegal action. That would make sense, yes. <laughs> Especially when it's some kind of thing of like, we have these crystals, we would be willing to sell them to you, but we want to trade for the slaves instead. And then also once we do that, we refuse to give them to you. And so we're super trustworthy and you should be cool with us keeping the ladies. Picard would have had them in the brig by this point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> See, this this gets me. I Growing up, I kept hearing the witch is a better captain, Kirk or Picard, and I listened to the things. And I hadn't actually watched all the way through original series. I'd seen bits and pieces. Yeah. This, how is there an argument? <laughs> Picard would take the reasonable actions and, you know, have some consequences for this kind of behavior happen. A hamster is a better captain than Kirk. <laughs> captain Simeon is a better captain than Kirk. So I'm, apparently, I'm the only one who remembers Captain Simeon and the Space Monkeys. The name is familiar, but I don't think I've seen it. So <laughs> Yeah, it was a weird 90s cartoon that I, I seem to be the only one in the world who watched. <laughs> but it's kind of a direct Star Trek ripoff with sentient chimpanzees. <laughs> and they are better captains. I, I don't remember the name of the captain from Spud Trek, but you know the, the, the captain there is probably better, too. Yes. Everyone's... <laughs> <sighs> Did I ever tell you about Spud Trek? I think I might have. It's is it the one with Pringles cans? No, no, it's uh, okay. something that was on like public access where I was growing up, uh, like uh, like a ten minute short sort of thing. Like they had a few episodes that I I saw parts of. The you know the the opening is you know you know we boldly go to seek out new you know life and new civilizations and then forbid them forever. <laughs> And basically, it's all done with, with potatoes and, like, you know, stop motion sort of stuff. <laughs> I barely remember anything about it beyond that. That sounds, like, vaguely familiar, because I used to go to a lot of Star Trek cons when I was younger. <laughs> and they would show compilations of, like, internet shorts and stuff, or, you know, the, the precursors to internet shorts where people would just share videotapes around. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I feel like I might have seen at least part of that at a convention once. Neat. <laughs> I'd love to see that at some point. Maybe I should like try to track that down. It might be on. It's probably on YouTube somewhere. To the internet. <laughs> I don't know. That's mostly all I had to say about this. I just want. I wanted to make sure everyone realizes that they showed a textbook domestic abuse relationship. They acted like it was fine and dandy, and the Enterprise just left them there. Apparently, sex trafficking is legal. In I was going to say the Federation. We don't even know what this is at this point. The whole thing's been confusing as all get out up to now. I don't... I, I'm completely out of things to say for this episode. So uh, I guess the uh, we should probably uh, you know start bringing this to a close of some sort. Now, I guess the future sucks and everyone's terrible in it. So this is not really idealistic. And so I guess I have one final question. Would this have been a better first episode or not? I mean... No, because it's the like, objectively a worse episode. Like apart from even if we ignore like the themes and stuff, which mm -hmm. both of them have bad themes about how women are just tricking you with their beauty and whatever. Yes. The just this episode drags horribly. It's not written or made well. There's giant plot holes in it that make no sense. Yep. This is just like from from the standards of television writing, this is a horrible piece of television all the way through. I have to agree. <laughs> Might look pretty at times, but that's kind of about it. And that's only because the camera work. Like, can I just say I, I am apparently watching most of these for the first time. I thought I had seen more original series than I have. I, I'd seen like part of this episode, uh, like like last I don't know, uh, 20 minutes or something like that. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. Back then. Well, I was watching the last 20 minutes and went, what the hell? Having seen the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, when does this become the beloved TV series that launched 50 years of science fiction? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's coming up soon. Maybe, maybe I hope so. Maybe we have to wait until the menagerie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe. They just, just they had like those whole things of like every season it was about to be canceled, and every season there were massive write-in campaigns to save the show from fans. Like, what fans? Why did anyone enjoy this? I don't know. 
Yeah, I, I, I really enjoy later Star Trek, but I'm really, really struggling through this here. I know. This just, every time I watch one of these, I'm like, I need to watch a Next Generation episode. Just sort like, of right the palette. <laughs> I need to remember why I like this series. Anything else we should uh, poke at, or we, uh, should we wrap it up here? Oh, well, that's all that I had. Next episode is one that I am completely unfamiliar with called what are little girls made of hmm. so i i kind of read the little synopsis thing on amp on uh, netflix which said it's something about female androids which i guess i thought this episode was about female androids i guess that was i mud that i yeah, was remembering that's the, the next mud episode yeah but this one is also female androids so we had an episode that i thought was androids and now we're gonna have an episode that is androids and then next season we get a mud episode with androids androids everybody coming down droids yeah i just hope that i don't know as good as data or something i'm looking at pictures of the costume that this android is in and it does not look like we're getting an improvement anytime soon nope <laughs> it's more scantily clad than uh you know uh yeah. Yeah. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, we find out exactly how to build the most powerful woman in the universe. Maybe. You have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcasts, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Izix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Izix, and Twitter at IzixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, Please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists.